So we welcome you again today. Thank you for being here. Church family, let me just uh, add to what Terry said. Thank you. It was a blessing just to watch you come forward and and give of your, your money and your resources to your local church that you love and that you support. And let me just say again, guests, we're delighted that you are here. And we just pray that you sense some of the excitement and the joy that we are sensing God doing in our church. And we're just thrilled that you came. Hope you uh, are made to feel very welcome. And if there's anything we can do for you to encourage you, let us know. I, and my wife and I would love to, love to meet you and, and talk with you at the end of the service if you have uh, just a few minutes. So speaking of my wife, she and I, we probably like most of you, we have a couple of television shows that we enjoy watching. And most of the times we tape these shows. Don't, aren't you just glad you don't have to watch the commercials? Isn't that a blessed thing? Just, it's called fast forward. Amen. Just fast forward right on through them. So a couple of them are Survivor. For 15 years, Ashley and I have been watching Survivor. I keep threatening that one day I'm going to make an application and go on that show. And uh, I know I'm serious. And they could, all they could do is turn me down. But if I win a million dollars, I promise to give a lot of it to the church. How's that? So... I don't think I'd last. I don't think I'd last very long on Survivor. I'm, I'm sure. So, what's some of the other shows we like? Oh, um, Designated Survivor. I like Designated Survivor. Kiefer Sutherland. And I was watching this show the other night, and he made a statement, and I thought that was a very interesting statement. So I rewinded, and I wrote it out, and I'm going to share it with you here in just a minute because. All of us have hard times, right? We all deal with, with different things and difficulties, whether it's in finances or maybe our jobs, or some of you may be struggling in personal relationships with your family, with your marriages, or with your kids or grandkids. And whenever I watch this show, Designated Survivor, I always come away going, man, I don't have any problems. I mean, I, I listened to the president, Keith Sutherland's playing President Kirkman, and this is what he made in his statement in the last episode. I thought this was, it was so sad. He said, NATO is coming apart. My son is being sued. My mentor is a potential murder suspect, and my mother-in-law is being grilled by the FBI. <laughs> That's pretty bad, right? And he said, and I'm just sitting here watching the world burn, but it's time to pick up a bucket. And that's what I want to help you to, to do today. I want to help you pick up a bucket and put some water in it and put out some of these fires that you're dealing with in your life. Like I said a moment ago, whether it's personal or whether it's of a family nature or maybe even your business or your job, and maybe even in your church, you may be just struggling with something and you're going through a hard time and you're hurting and you come upon this Thanksgiving Eve. And you know, I love Thanksgiving and I love Christmas, I love the holidays, but I'm reminded that these are some of the most difficult times for many people. Many people, they will not have their loved one with them. And for the first time in many, many years, they will be in Thanksgiving without their loved one, their spouse, or maybe a child or a grandchild who has departed from this life. So you may be here today, and, and I just commend you for being here. It may have been a very, very difficult thing to get up and make your way to church and to worship the Lord. And isn't it therapeutic, though? Isn't it something amazing what God does when we, we come together with the people of God? And, and we don't mitigate or minimize our hurt, but we take our hurt and we say, God, take our hurt. And Lord, in the midst of my hurt and my pain, I want to worship you, God, and give you my best. And so if you're struggling with that today, I'm just going to come alongside you as an encourager. I'm going to come alongside you as someone who has been studying the Word of God, preparing a message, especially for those who are struggling with hurt or you're dealing with a hard time on this Thanksgiving Eve. And so my text is a very famous passage of Scripture. It's Isaiah chapter 40. The main text is those who wait on the Lord. They will mount up with wings like eagle. they will eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and they will not faint. Well, what does that mean? And so today we get to unpack that. We get to study that with you. And so, so glad that you're here to experience the worship of God with the people of God. And so I'm going to read it to you. It's Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 27. I'll begin throughout the, to the remainder of uh, the chapter. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the peace. And thank you for the healing that we receive as we study God's precious word, his gift to us. So let me give you just a little background as to what is going on in the life of Isaiah. Isaiah writes this around, well, he's a prophet of God. His ministry spans for decades, but this was probably written around 700 B.C., seven centuries before 
of the time of Christ. And when Isaiah writes these words, 700 B.C., remember 722, Israel has already fallen. The capital, the northern kingdom of Samaria, the ten tribes to the north, have already fallen prey to the Assyrian army. And so they've been in exile, they have been deported, they have been going through a tremendously difficult time. And now Isaiah, he looks into the future with a word of prophecy to those in Jerusalem, who they too will be captured. And we know what happens in 586 when the Babylonian Empire comes in, really begins around 600, 608, 609, and that begins the first massive wave or deportation of the people in Jerusalem, and they're taken to the land of Babylon. And so Isaiah writes right in the middle of this conflict. When the people of God are in a very difficult place in their lives, not only individually in their families, but also corporately in the, in the entire country of Israel to the north and, and Judah to the south, and they've experienced these very crushing, catastrophic, I mean, calamitous times, and Isaiah comes along to them, and the first thing he does is he addresses their complaint. They are complaining. They are criticizing. They have been offended, and the person that they're mad at more than anybody is God himself. Isn't that interesting? They got themselves in this situation, but now instead of calling out to God for help, they begin to blame God, and they're in their spirit, in their hearts, they have become offended because they think God has let them down. You know anybody like that? You say, well, yeah, by the way, I do know somebody like that. I looked at him in the mirror today. That's me because I'm offended and I'm hurt because I believe God has disappointed me. I believe God could have come through and he chose not to. And I just want you to know I'm, I'm having a hard time today. Praise God. I'm glad you're here. Okay. It took a lot of guts for you to get here today. You could have stayed home and wallowed in the mire and the quagmire of self-pity. And you could have said, well, I'm just going to suck on some lemons and eat some worms and die. I tell you, the world, I'm just, I'm just sad and I'm mad. No, glory to God, I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad you're here to hear this message. Now, this message, will, it'll, it's going to prick you a little bit. It's going to pierce you a little bit, all right? But I want you to stay with the pricking and the piercing and the surgery because toward the end of the service, you'll see the balm of healing. And you'll see some, I mean, you'll just see some Holy Spirit moments as God Almighty just massages your heart. Ooh, let me tell you, the God that made you is the God that can comfort you. The God that crafted you and created you gave you everything in your whole body, including your soul and your spirit and your mind and everything that you possess, this great God that I get to preach about today and worship him with you, this God will deliver you in his time. So here it is, verse 27. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? Well, my way is hidden from God. My way is hidden from the Lord. And my just claim has been passed over by my God. Do y'all see the accusation there? He, they are saying, God, you've let us down. God, maybe you were taking a cosmic nap. And God, I don't know what you're doing up in heaven, but you have let things go here on planet Earth. And they're just spinning. They're chaotic. They're out of control. And we thought, God, you were awesome. And we thought, God, that you were in control. So why, God? Have you allowed this to, to happen? I tell you, it's, it's happening today, isn't it? It seems like every week there's a new mass murder, a new shooting uh, of someone taking an, a, another person's life, an innocent person's life. Or if it's not that, it seems to be another natural catastrophe. I mean, just, just this a few days ago, this massive earthquake on the border of Iran and Iraq. I mean, multitudes of people died and their homes destroyed. And just this week here in our country, in California, a crazed, demonically possessed man goes and shoots and kills people. And then he goes to an elementary school and he's just blowing the place up with bullets and he's ramming his car. He's trying to get in to take as many innocent lives as he can. And you're like, yeah, Brother Danny, what's up with that? This world is crazy. Where is God? What's God doing? What it, wh why will he not just... Well, that's what's going on back then. It's a different set of circumstances. But it created the same angst. It created the same pain. And they are offended. They are offended by God. And Isaiah says, hold on just a second. <laughs> 
Aren't you glad that God sends some people that says, hold on just a second. And I'm going to be your hold on for just a second today, okay? Preaching God's word, using the very words of Isaiah when he begins with these rhetorical questions. Verse 28. Israel, have you not known or have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord? Elohim is everlasting. There's never been a time that he has not existed. How could he pass over your just claim? How could he forget you when he's everlasting? He knows everything. He's omniscient. He's all-powerful. He's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. He is all places at all times. And then Isaiah calls him the Lord. The Lord, whenever you see that that word, Yahweh, Jehovah, it is the self-existent eternal God who was and is and will forever be. He is the creator. Do do y'all see what Isaiah is doing? He's taken the complaint and the criticism. He's taking the accusation and the offense. And he's doing the absolute best thing that he can do is he is confronting it in love. Okay? He is speaking truth to the false. He has given hope where there seems to be just despair. The people of Israel, like the people in in, in America and all over the world, when trouble comes and difficulty comes, we develop this amazing sense of spiritual amnesia. (laughs) We get spiritual dementia and Alzheimer's spiritually. We completely forget who God is and how awesome God is in our moments of trial and tribulation. And speaking of those hideous diseases, I was thrilled to hear that Bill Gates, who has a few dollars, by the way, is given $100 million to help find a cure for dementia and Alzheimer's. I think that's wonderful. But you know what? Spiritually, spiritually, we fall into this trap. Calamity comes, difficulty comes, and instead of remembering who God is, we forget who God is, and so sometimes it's good to be reminded just who this God is. And so Isaiah says, have you not known, have you not heard? The Lord, he's everlasting. He's the creator of the ends of the earth. Can I just get an amen for that part right there? Amen. He keeps going. He never faints and he does not get weary. So so much for your accusation of the cosmic deity taking a nap on the job. No, he can't because he's always present. He's always watching. He never faints. He's never weary. He's just absolutely in control. And his understanding is unfathomable. It's unsearchable. You can't plummet the depths of the knowledge and the wisdom of God. And then he just, man, then he just like takes off into a sermon. He gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, God increases their strength. Even the youths shall faint and they will get weary. And the young men, well, they shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord, isn't that good? But those who trust in God, but those who say, Lord, we don't understand everything, and we really don't even understand everything about you, and Lord, I don't don't really understand why you're allowing all these things to happen to me or to my country or to my family, but this I will do, God. I will trust you. I will wait on you. And Isaiah says, and when we do that, we exchange strength. God renews our strength. We mount up with wings like eagles. We run and we do not become weary. And we walk and do not faint. So a couple things I want to look at with you in our text today is, first of all, I I, I want to deal with the negativity for a moment. The negative has to do with Verse 40, verse 27. During hard times, we often become offended. And so if you have your your notes and you want to take some notes there in the first blank there. During hard times, we become offended. Tell you, the children of Israel gave God a pretty harsh accusation. It's almost like they became the prosecuting attorneys and God was on defense. And they were saying, here's Here's your problem, God. Here's here's what you've done to us. Verse 27, you have, our way is hidden from you and my just claim is passed over by you, God, and we're not happy about it. Of course, it's, it's, it's sad, but it's like Israel had created this mess that they got themselves in and, and, Even though they have gotten themselves in this mess and it's nobody's fault but their own, they begin to blame God and cry out to God as if God had done them wrong. 
You know, Jesus, he said something about this in the Gospel of Luke. In Luke chapter 7, verse 23, Jesus said, Markurios, blessed are you if you never become offended because of me. I want you to look at that for, with me for a moment. Blessed are you who is not scandalizo because of me. The Greek word there for offense is scandalos. It's where we get the English word, shazam, it's where we get the English word to scandal or to scandalize. To be offended or to have this scandal happens when we are supposed to be trusting, but we are distrusting. We are supposed to be relying, but we refuse to rely because we've been offended, we've been hurt, and a scandal, a barrier has been erected between us and God. And isn't Jesus wise? Isn't he amazing when he said, oh, wait a minute, church, please do not become offended because of me. Just because you don't understand me does not mean that I have done something wrong, God might say. Now, the context of Luke chapter 7 is this. I know some of you are just dying to know what is the context of Luke chapter 7. Well, thank you for asking me because I really want to share this with you, okay? And it goes like this. John the Baptist is in prison. John the Baptist is in prison. Think about that for just a moment. Jesus' cousin, the forerunner, the great prophet who has been prophesied of old in the Old Testament. And here he comes, 400 years, the intertestamental period. There's been no prophecy, no word from God. And here he comes, John the Baptist, eating locusts, eating honey, long flowing hair. He is quite a sight. And he comes on the scene and he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he points to his cousin. He points to the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And John the Baptist says, I must decrease and he must increase. He is the King. He is the Lord. And all you people that have been following me, let's all collectively go and follow Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, that's right, John. Y'all come. And Jesus takes them under his wing and he teaches them. Now, John, for all of his faithfulness, for all of his preaching... For all the good deeds that he has done, look where it got him. It got him in prison. He's about to be decapitated. He's about to become a martyr. And so John the Baptist does something that I often do, and I don't know if you do this or not, but I often question in the dark what God revealed to me in the light. And now John the Baptist says, are you really the Messiah? Y'all remember this story? You remember this in Luke chapter 7? John says, disciples, go and ask Jesus, are you really the Messiah? Are you the anointed one? Are you the one that I've been preaching and prophesying about? Because if you are, then please, he please heaven, tell me, why am I in prison? Why, why don't you just break me out of here? Jesus, what is going on here? Are you the one? And this is harsh. Are you the one? Or do I need to look for somebody else? Whoo. You say, man, God's people talk to God like that? Yes, they did. Some of you did it this week. <laughs> Maybe some of you did it this morning. Listen, again, I'm glad you're here because you took your hurt, you took your pain. It would be easy just to say, well, I'm just oh, fooey on God, fooey on the church. I'm just going to, I mean, they disappoint me all the time and I'm offended. Well, guess what? I get offended and it bothers me that I get offended. I had this guy pull out in front of me uh, two days ago, and I was just bebopping down the road, listening to Christian music, hallelujah, singing praise to the Lord. And this guy not only pulled in front of me, but he slowed down to almost antagonize me. And I'm, fly I'm flying by 55, that's pretty fast for me, 60 miles an hour, and he just slows down, and he comes up beside me and just snarls at me like... And I rolled down my window and I said, you heretic. No, I didn't do any of that. I didn't do any of that. <laughs> I, just, I just smiled at him because I know he was wanting me to honk. He was wanting me to get angry. And I just smiled, but I didn't like the way I felt. I'm like, self, why are you so mad? Well, this guy pulled out in front of me. Big deal. Did you get killed? No. Did you lose anything on your vehicle? No. Well, why are you so mad? Because your way was preempted by somebody else, and in your pride, Brother Danny, you got mad. I did. I did. Not only do I get offended, but I offend people. Yeah, he said. <laughs> I do. I, I'm, it's true. It's true. I, I have that gift. 
My kids will tell me, Dad, did, did you not see the lady? She was waving at you, and you just walked right by her. And I said, I, I, I never saw I never saw her. They're like, oh, Dad. D- Dad, did you hear? That, that guy was speaking to you. He was actually talking to you. And you, Hannah, you know it, don't you, baby? It's your poor dad. I'm just like, I'm in another world sometimes, y'all. I'm just like, in another, and, and people are speaking, and it looks like he's arrogant. It looks like he doesn't care, but he's just, he's just walking right on by people. Oh, let me, let me give you a good one I did recently. It's getting quiet in here. I love it. There's a group of ladies in the church. <laughs> Some church ladies. Amen. They're wonderful. And they put on an amazing lunch for us every year. They prepare a meal for us around this fall time of the year, and it's like the highlight of my year food speaking because it's delicious. Well, me, I'm going to go on Facebook and just tell all those ladies how appreciative I am. But I know me. I know I'm going to forget somebody, right? And so I asked somebody else, help me, am I forgetting anybody? And they said, no, you're not. I said, okay, well, I'm good. I list everybody's name, and I forgot somebody. Oh, and guess what she did? She went on Facebook, and underneath my comments, she said, such a joy to serve you, Pastor. It was such a joy to serve my church leadership. I'm just so blessed. And not to mention anybody's names, but Deborah Howard, God bless you. (laughs) No, really, just... No, I'm getting emotional talking about this because I know me. I know in my heart I, I never, ever would have purposefully said, okay, which one of these women can I just offend? You, you, I, I, no, no. In fact, Deborah was the one that spoke. She spoke in the meeting and I forgot her. She never said a word. She just typed underneath. And as soon as I saw her name, I went, oh, goodness, goodness. So you can just give me some, some slack because it's not, it's, Sometimes I offend people preaching. I can't apologize for that. But sometimes I just, I'm just offensive. A lot of times when we are easily offended, it says more about us than it does the person offending us. Because it deals with our pride, right? Now, y'all, come on, help me. I confessed my pride before you in my vehicle. So think about that for just a minute. If you're easily offended and think people have disappointed you, even God has disappointed you, the issue is you. It's all about us, right? Boy, that's something hard for us to get over, and I'm still working on it. I told y'all there's going to be some prickly pear moments at the beginning. But now, let me get into the second part of this sermon, because this is the part I was really looking forward to. So what do we do? How do we overcome these hard times? And Isaiah tells us very clearly what we are to do. If you're taking notes, there are two things. Number one, remember the Lord. Remember the Lord. And number two, wait on God. Number one, remember the Lord. Have you not known? Isaiah said, have you not heard? And Isaiah, I could just see Isaiah going, people, have you, have you developed spiritual uh, uh, amnesia? Have you forgotten just who God is? And the children of Israel could honestly reply, yes, we have. In the moment of our hurt and in the moment of our pain, We have developed this amnesia. We have developed this forgetfulness. And Isaiah says, he is the everlasting Lord. He is the God who created you. And so remember, remember him. Memory is a powerful weapon that oftentimes we relegate or put on the shelf in the midst of our hurt, in the midst of our confusion, in the midst of us being misunderstood or misunderstanding, we all of a sudden forget all the goodness of God. We forget all the times that God has delivered us. And so I love what Isaiah does. He combats it head on. He goes, have you not known? Have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth? He He never faints and he's not weary. His understanding is unsearchable. And he just goes on and on. He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. I love what one person said about this text, and I I jotted it down. I want to read it to you. He said, Isaiah 40 finds the people of Israel enslaved in Babylon. 
Their temple has been destroyed. Their sacrificial system has ceased. But Isaiah says, God gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. These verbs are in the present tense, indicating that God is doing this right now as we speak. Even though they do not see him at work in their suffering, he is. They do not know that God is raising up Cyrus. Cyrus will become the king of the Medes and the Persians. Cyrus in 538 will say, enough, let God's people go. A pagan king will make a, make a regal declaration that I, Cyrus, the king of the Medes and the Persians, we have defeated, we have vanquished the Babylon, Babylonian empire. Who are these Jewish people surrounding me? Let them go home. And so Zerubbabel, you go. And then there goes Nehemiah, and there goes Ezra. And we know about this, and when the, this holy history where, but they don't know all this. They don't know that God is working and putting things into place, but in their impatience and in their pride, they forgot about this. Okay, let me get back to reading. I got a little excited. Let me read. They do not know that he is raising up Cyrus and the Persian Empire, which will one day overthrow the Babylonians. In the same way, we cannot see all that God is doing in the circumstances of our world. Can I read that again? Somebody needs to hear this. Somebody's faith is shaken. Somebody here today, you're, you're teetering on apostasy. Well, maybe I'll just turn this whole Christianity thing in and try something else. Listen to these words. In the same way, we cannot see all that God is doing in the circumstances of our world. Hard times come, don't they, church? No matter who you are. The young will get tired and they will grow weary. All of us will faint. All of us will have times of suffering and questioning and, and hurt and God where are you God please help my marriage God please deliver my children God please rid me of this oncoming disease and, and, and it's like heaven is like brass it's like there's this silence in the heavens what do we do what do we do in those moments do we just throw our hands up in the air and say, forget you, God, why don't you help me? Or do we remember and say, oh, God, you are still God. You are still on your throne, and I choose to trust you, God. That's a much better response. It's so easy, so guttural, it's so human to get angry, to be offended, and just get even angry at God. And Isaiah enters in that, and he goes, wait a minute, don't forget, just calm down. Put one foot in front of the other. Trials dark on every hand, and we cannot understand all the ways that God would lead us to that blessed promised land. But He'll guide us with His eye, and we'll follow Him until we die, and we'll understand it better by and by. So remember the Lord. Number two, wait on the Lord. Oh, goodness, Pastor, did you use that word? That is a four-letter word, by the way. Did you just use that word? And I did. Wait, wait, wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. You say, well, if I do wait on the Lord, what, what will happen? What will God do? God will do miracles when we wait on Him. Every time we try to help God, we end up hurting ourselves. We get ahead of God and say, God, you're slow. Let me help you. I'm, and Abraham and Sarah I say, well, God, I guess you're not going to give us a child, so let's go sleep with Hagar and let's see how that works. We see how that works. It never works out good. It's not God's intention that we help him. It's God's desire that we trust him. Why is that so hard? I don't know. I just know I'm in it with you. How's that? If it helps, I'm in the fray with you. But if we will wait on the Lord, Isaiah gives us four promises. Number one, our strength will be renewed. Strength will rise as you wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord our God. You reign forever. Like, remember that song? Lincoln Brewster sung it, but Chris Tomlin wrote it. And I just believe he had Isaiah chapter 40 before his face. How could you write a song like that and not have Isaiah chapter 40? Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Now waiting on the Lord 
is not some passive posture where we do nothing. Waiting on the Lord sometimes involves just putting one foot in front of the other. Waiting on God to show up and answer doesn't mean on Sunday mornings we stay home and curse God and angry at God. But we we wait and we come and we worship. And we wait on God and we treat people with kindness. And we wait on God and we pray to God when our bodies are ill and we're hurting. But but God, we're going to do the right thing. We're going to trust in you. And as we're waiting on you, God then God begins to do something. He begins to renew our strength. And it's a beautiful thing. It's a miraculous thing. It's a thing that only God can do. Number two, what else happens to us? We mount up with wings like eagles as we wait on the Lord. Aren't you glad it doesn't say they mount up like a turkey? (laughs) Turkeys don't mount. Turkeys, about the only thing they're good for is eating. Amen. Just, Just shoot them and eat them. Or crossbow them. I don't care. Just feed me. Feed me. A crow. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. And the eagle. No, a crow. No, not, not a crow. A crow can only get up to about 500 feet, but an eagle can go 10,000 feet. And the air as it lifts that eagle. Do we see the eagle on the screen there? Look at that rascal. He is high and lifted up. I pray that God does that for some of you today. He would lift you up so you get a better perspective. There he is again. How could I just say war, eagle, amen? But anyhow, there he is. He's just, <laughs> sorry, I know it's a little premature, but anyhow, it, there he is. Oh, you think that makes you mad? Let me show you the next one. Woo. Woo. Come on. That's fighting words, right? He said, why'd you put that in there? Because I wanted to offend you. That's, that's the only reason I did. <laughs> that's pretty cool. The Cowboys are playing the Eagles today, by the way. And I hope they pluck their feathers. I really do. I hope they beat them. They probably won't, but that's another story. Mount up with wings like an eagle. You tell me if I, if I trust God, and I don't understand God, and and I just say, Lord, I'm, I'm leaning into you instead of away from you. Are you telling me that God will begin to give me strength? That God will lift me up in an elevated way so that I can see at a better perspective? That's exactly what I'm saying. Because that's a promise from the Word of God. Next, he says, they shall run and not be weary. And as a runner, this, this meant a lot to me. Because I like to run. And whenever I train properly and when I run in a race it goes really well but when I don't train like I should and show up for a race and say well I'm just going to beat my personal best time today that's ridiculous but we will run and not be weary because we are waiting on the Lord watch this oh it's a good word when you're waiting on God you're preparing yourself for a greater blessing when you're waiting on God, is when my waiting on God is when I'm training, when I'm running, like I ran this week. I ran hills. They about killed me. I ran intervals. Anybody know what an interval is? They're awful. They're like burpees. You ever know what a seen a burp? Almost did a burpee for you. Amen. But you know, you know things are nasty and they're painful and they hurt. But come Thursday on the turkey trot, I'm going to be able to do well because I've been I've been training. I've been I've been working at. How ridiculous it would be of me just to show up and say, Well, I'm here. I ain't trained any, and I'm just going to do my personal best. No, there is a training, there is a perspiration, there is a trying time. And and spiritually, when we wait on God, it's very painful, it's very hard, but God's preparing us to win. And he's saying, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to do amazing things in you and through you, but it's going to be on my time. It's not going to be on your time. And when it happens, when it goes down, you're going to lift me up, and you're going to worship me, and I'm going to say, you're welcome. That's what God's going to do. I believe that with all my heart. That's just how God works. He just doesn't work according to our timetable. He doesn't doesn't do what we tell him to do. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad you didn't marry her? You know what I'm saying? Ma'am, aren't you glad you didn't marry that guy? Oh, he broke my heart. God, where are you? God, I'm sparing you. I'm sparing you, and I got somebody else for you. And God does that kind of stuff. He and Jeffrey and Hannah are looking at a house. I hope they get it. And they, and they said, 
well, if you had come a few weeks ago, a few months ago, it would be $300 more a month to rent. But they waited and they were patient. I hope y'all get that house. That's cool. Not that I'm trying to kick y'all out or anything, but <laughs> well, I love having y'all in our house. But the principle is wait. I know it's hard. Look at this last one. We'll walk and not faint. You say, what's the big deal about that? I'm going to tell you what the big deal is. When you don't know what to do, take the next step of faith. And watch what God does. Put one foot in front of the other. What does it say? And soon you'll be, you got it, keep, keep going. And soon you'll be what? Walking out the door. As you wait on the Lord, He makes it so that you don't faint. He makes it so that you can put one step, and that's really all, sometimes, and some of you here today, I'm going to be honest with you. The, the best possible thing you could do is just take the next step toward God. Because I know some of you are hurt because you tell me, and I'm thrilled that you tell me because I pray for you. And I know some of the pain and the angst and the anger and, and the anticipation. I hear you. And, and what I'm offering to you today is just, just trust God. Wait on God. Put one foot in front. Don't get angry. Don't get bitter. Don't be offended. Just put one foot in front of the other and see what the Lord does. I'm going to close. It's 12 o'clock. Look at there. 12 o'clock. And I'm almost done. I'm going, to, I'm going to read something to you. It's the same guy I read to you a moment ago. Uh, Jim Dennison. He was my philosophy of religion professor years ago. And I enjoy his writings. Listen to what he says. This is a good summation of what I've been saying the last few minutes. Those who choose to trust God in Babylon can claim these promises. Number one, they shall renew their strength. The Hebrew indicates that they will have God's strength, not just their own strength. How about that? Number two, they shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall escape the shackles of this fallen world, and they'll mount up, not just like any bird, but like an eagle, 10,000 feet above. Three, they shall run and not be weary. Those who depend on God for their strength will run the race with endurance, Hebrews 12, 1. Isn't that good? Finally, they shall walk and not faint. No matter their speed or their circumstances, they will have all that they need. And then he makes this statement. These promises did not explain why God allowed Babylon to enslave Israel. These promises do not explain why God would allow a Devon Kelly to murder 26 people at the First Baptist Church of Sutherland Springs, Texas. I believe it's a mystery, like the Trinity, that our finite minds simply cannot fully comprehend. But our text does tell us, here's how we are to respond. We choose to wait on God. When we trust His will, though we do not understand His ways, we find in Him the strength we need to fly, to run, to walk through the deepest valleys and the darkest days. Corey Ten Boom, Holocaust survivor, who experienced the worst sins of humanity, she said, quote, Faith sees the invisible. It believes the unbelievable. And it receives the impossible. Father, we thank you for your word. It is life to our flesh. It is health to our bones. Lord, there are some in our midst today, God, they are like the children of Israel in verse 27, and they are crying out, foul. That's not fair. Why, God? You're asleep. What's going on? Is this how you treat your children? Lord, I don't understand. God, thank you that they're here. Thank you, Lord, in the midst of their hurt and their pain, they, of, a, of a decision of the volition of their will, they came to church. And God, you spoke to them. You spoke to them precisely in the very heart of their struggle. And God, you are just God. Only you can do that. And only you, Holy Spirit, would put this passage of Scripture on my heart. Never preached this passage of Scripture. I've always loved it, always admired it from a distance, but never preached it. And thank you, Lord, that on this Thanksgiving Eve, I get to preach this message to her who struggles today and to him who feels like throwing in the towel. With your heads bowed and with your eyes closed, can I just, can I just remind you how much God absolutely loves you? Oh, how he loves you. 
Oh, how he cherishes you. Oh, I know we don't understand. And I know we have our doubts. And I know even times we get offended. And I hear the words of Jesus say, don't do that. Please don't become offended by me just because you don't understand. Though I cannot trace or track the hand of God, I know I can always trust the heart of God. And so God is telling you today, sir, he's not just whispering, is he? He is is shouting it from his word, from this pulpit, that I have you. I have got you. I never left you. I never let you go. I see you. Trust in me. Wait on me. And when you get to heaven, it may only be when you get to heaven that you'll fully understand. So Lord, we trust you. We wait on you. God, renew our strength. Lord, lift us up like the eagle. Cause us to be able to run the marathon, Lord, and not be weary. And some, Lord, just cause us to to walk. For some of you today, listening to this prayer, listening to this sermon, this this is going to be a divine moment for you. This is going to be a moment that's going to change the absolute course of your life. Instead of being mad at God every time you don't get your way, this word from God's going to enable you and energize you not to get mad at Him, but to love Him and to trust Him and to walk by faith with Him. God bless you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to us today. Lord, for some in this room, God, they need to take that step, that next step. And that next step, Lord, for some is just a walk with God, a walk toward God by faith. Bringing nothing, bringing nothing to offer, but just say, God, have mercy on me. And I trust in you. you, Is that you today, sir? Is that you, ma'am? Are you the one that God is just loving you into his kingdom right now? And he is wooing you. He is saying, just come, believe and receive. Trust in Jesus Christ and Him alone. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for saving people. In Jesus' name I pray. You know, my wife, she tells me something. And it's, it's, it's good theology. Sometimes, you know, you, you get frustrated. So, oh, what was this going to do with it? She says, well, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Who else are you going to turn to? There's nobody but the Lord. That's awesome theology. And in those moments of doubt and in those moments of despair, well, I'll just just walk away. Who are you going to turn to? Anything else? Anybody else makes a terrible God but Jesus. That is a good word. Everybody makes terrible gods. But Jesus, he is loving, he is compassion, he is kind. Can I encourage some of you to just take a step? Just take a step toward God today, spiritually. Some of you want to come down to the altar. This is a sacred place. This is a safe place. You can weep. You can kneel. You can can cry out to God. you You can talk to God. If you want somebody to talk with you, we'll talk with you. Some of you need to take another step. And you're like, hold on. You're telling the truth. And yet some of you got smiling, you're smiling, and you got a little, a little glow about you, and you're going, he's telling the truth. I used to be there, and I trusted God, and God is blessing me. Ooh, ooh, ooh. He's blessing me, like a orangutan up here. He's blessing me, and he's, he's empowering me, and, and I'm just so grateful to God. And, and I say I rejoice with you. I praise God for you, and I am thrilled for you, and I'm, I'm with you. I'm seeing God do amazing things through us waiting and, and, and patiently walking with him. Some of you want to say, I want to take a step toward God. I want to be a part of this this church family. We want you to be a part of this family. December the 3rd, we're going to have another Discover Great Hills class. You come, understand, get plugged in, serve the Lord with us. It's a beautiful thing, being part of a community of faith. So let me ask you to stand on up to your feet. Brother Terry is here. The band and the team's going to lead us in some singing. And we're going to be here at the front. You come, let us encourage you. Or you may just want to come to the altar and pray to the Lord. God bless you as you come. God bless you.